Today, we're continuing our series for this reason. And it seems like Paul says that a lot, so we've chosen that as the title for this series. Uh, we'll be doing multiple series, no doubt, in Ephesians, but this one's called for this series. I'm gonna be in verse 15 and 17 of Ephesians chapter one. So either get out your Bibles or turn your phones on or whatever, because that's where the scripture often is. And we wanna get right into it. If you didn't get to hear last week's message, uh, Tom did an outstanding job. And so I'll encourage you to receive that on our website. And if I've not met you, uh, I'm Glenn, my wife, Amy and I, we've been here forever. And we have a joy of having a great team of pastors and John and Steph are doing a great job here as campus pastors. Can you say amen? And uh, so we part of the preaching team when we get a chance to rotate in here. Otherwise, we, if you don't see us, we're probably working with one of the other churches. And so it's a great joy to share with you. Ephesians chapter one. Today, I wanna challenge us on something that's on my heart, not only for this house, but I believe for this city and for the body of Christ in the church. And I ask myself, what are the means of us being strengthened in our faith? And here we are at the first, the end of the first quarter of the year with the theme strengthened. And it might be good for us to ask ourselves the question, how is that strengthening journey going for us so far? Paul gives us some insights, particularly in chapter one and chapter two and three, but chapter one we have seen, and he starts here in verse 15 with that word, three words, say it with me, for this reason. Obviously, that connects him with the rest of the chapter, doesn't it? And you've been hearing us say that that reason that Paul is referring to is that for the reason that you were chosen by the Father. That's how he starts, wasn't it? Before the foundation of the world, you were chosen in him to be holy and blameless. In him, you have forgiveness of sins, the redemption through his blood. So we're chosen by the Father. You've heard us talk about being what? Redeemed by the Son and sealed by the Holy Spirit. So he's giving that truth and he says, because of that, I wanna tell you this. So for this reason, now let's read that. For this reason, Paul says, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. Now those are simple words, but when I read those, they just stood out to me afresh. And I wanna talk about today what does it really mean? What are some indicators? Those are almost too common of words. Why is he saying that? When I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, he said, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, I like how he always, he uses that a lot, doesn't he? the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom. Say that with me, the spirit of wisdom. This means this is a spiritual understanding of revelation and the knowledge of Him. This is the knowledge of the Father. Now you can't know the Father without knowing Jesus. Jesus reveals the Father, right? But in this context, he's saying, by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is a spirit of wisdom and revelation, that you might know the Father. That's his prayer. So there's something in this that we need to get a hold of. I wanna ask a question to myself though, why is Paul so passionate? What's behind this passion for him to make this statement? Because he's certainly not asking, oh, that I heard that you're a Christian. He already knew that. You know, we use that word faith so easily, don't we? We talk about being faith-based and faith this, and so it almost loses the context of what it really means to be a follower of Christ. When he says, when I heard of your faith, what is so significant about that passion? When he said, I heard of your love for the saints, 
Come on, Paul. You knew they're believers. You were there for the first time eight years before that. You hadn't seen them for five years. It wasn't that long ago. He can't be asking. He can't be referring to them just being believers. Like, I heard that you believed in Jesus. I heard that you're a Christian. No, he already knew that. So what's he referencing? What's behind the passion? Let's look in the book of Acts and see some of that. You may follow me if you want to, because there was something deep about this. The last time Paul had seen them, he had actually told them, you're not going to see my face again. I want you to imagine that with me. He had poured himself into them for three years. It says in Acts chapter 16 that this region called Asia Minor was the area where Ephesus, modern day Turkey, was located and the Holy Spirit had forbid him to go there. Listen to what the scripture says in Acts 16 verse six. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. We may know the general will of God, but we do not know the specific will of God. And we don't know the timing of God. If you don't hear any else, anything else I say today, I want you to see how much Paul depended upon the will of God in his life. He desired to go and the Holy Spirit forbid him. This is Ephesus. <laughs> When out of that passion, when he said, I heard of your faith, that's the place that he was forbidden to go. Once you get that, he was forbidden to go there. And when he did get to go, when he was able to go, you would have thought he would have gone and stayed, but he doesn't. Look in chapter 18. He shows up for a little bit and he leaves. It says in verse 18 of Acts 18, and I'm skipping through his journey here quickly. After this, Paul stayed many days longer. That's in Corinth. He was in the region of Macedonia and Corinth, and he stayed a little bit longer. And then he took leave of the brothers, left them, and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. And at Sincrea, he had his hair cut, for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus. Say that. And they came to Ephesus. This was Paul's first opportunity. It says, and he left them, who's that? Priscilla and Aquila. And he himself went into the synagogue. This is something Paul did re regularly. And he reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay longer, period, he declined. <laughs> now of all the places, Paul finally gets to go where the Holy Spirit had forbid him to go and he goes into the synagogue and he starts persuading them about Jesus and they say, we want to hear it stay. He says, no, <laughs> that's being led by God. Come on, not where the need is. We're driven by the need, aren't we? The need is huge. In fact, if you focus on the need, you're gonna feel like you're unproductive. If you focus on the center of God's will, you're gonna always know you're productive, you're bearing fruit. How many of you seem overwhelmed in the world we're in right now? You see all the need, what can I do? I can't make any difference, I wanna make a lot of difference. You start where God has you. Like what Jordan Peter says, before you change the world, go clean your room. Start where you are, right? There's something about recognizing where God has you. And Paul understood this and he said, and they came to Ephesus and he left them and he went to the synagogue and watch what he says. I will return to you if God wills. Do you see this strong dependence? I couldn't come here because the Holy Spirit forbid me. And when I got to come here, I'm gonna come back if God wills. Wow. And then when he does come back, we discovered that Apollos has already been there understanding John the Baptist preaching. Look in Acts 18. It says, now a Jew named Apollos, a native, this is verse 24 of Acts 18, a native of Alexandria came to Ephesus and he was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures, that's the Old Testament, 
And he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. I'm just going to throw this in here. For those of you that ask us, does this associate ourselves with the Old Testament? The Old Testament explains Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. When Jesus met the two disciples along the way after the resurrection, he did not even talk to them about his resurrection. He talked to them about himself from the time of Moses through all the prophets about Jesus. Somebody say the Old Testament's still valid. Just thought I'd insert that in there somehow. And it says, he instructed them concerning the ways. He knew only of the baptism of John, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, what does that mean? That means that he was not aware of the full work of Christ, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He knew what John the Baptist said, that the Messiah would come. He knew it was Jesus, but he had not experienced with understanding what the fullness of the day of Pentecost after the ascension had taken place. And so he was not preaching that, and so they taught him more accurately. So by the time that Paul gets to that again, gets back to Ephesus again in Acts chapter 19, he runs into more of these brothers who were followers of John. Listen to me in verse 1, Acts 19. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There it is again. And he found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism, which was what Apollos was teaching that would lead the way to the Messiah. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On this hearing, they were baptized in the name of the Lord, Jesus, and when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesying. And there were about 12 in all of them. Now watch verse eight. And he entered the synagogue, there he is again. And he entered the synagogue, and this time for three months, he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. What did he do? He got over in the prophets and the Old Testament and talked to them about the kingdom of God would come forth out of the lineage of David, and he taught them for three months concerning the kingdom and explained the gospel. Now, here's what happens. When you're preaching the pure gospel, it will either be a stepping stone for some or a stumbling block for others. They will either step out of their darkness or they'll stumble in their darkness. The gospel is the tool to harden hearts for some and soften hearts for some. We want people to like us. <laughs> The fear of man is a snare, isn't it? We want people to love us because we make idols out of ourselves. So when they don't like the gospel, some will be hardened. Now, some will hear, and you don't know when those who are hardened are going to come back around and hearing. You don't know that. But get ready. Not everybody's going to respond the way you want them to respond. And the scripture says that as he taught for these three months, watch what happens here, that some became stubborn. The more he taught, the more stubborn they became. And continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way. That's talking about speaking against Jesus and the Christianity before the congregation. And so what did he do? He withdrew. He knew his entrance. And he said, I, I'm here and later on, he said, I'm not guilty of any man's blood. I have been very open with the full counsel of God. But he knew by the Holy Spirit when to take those who were listening, watch what he did, and he took those disciples, what did he do? And the scripture says, and he went into the hall of Tyrannus, and there for two years he taught. He invested daily. In the synagogue, it was weekly. 
so they could go back home and study the scriptures and come back to see if those things be true. But these disciples, he gave it to them daily. This was the entrance that he had. Now, I want you to get this picture of Paul here in Ephesus, why he has this passion that's going on inside of him. In the temple or the temple of Artemis, the city of Ephesus was a place where the center, in fact, it was probably second only to Rome of its importance. And Artemis was the most revered goddess of all the Greeks. And the temple was about the size of a football field. And all of their economy and all of their association was tied to their understanding of what culture is. Culture comes out of your belief system. I wanna say it again. Culture comes out of your belief system. If there is a Christian influence in America, it's out of the biblical concept. It's not just American, it is biblical. You can take the same biblical concept and go into any nation of the world, may not be like America, but it'll have the same worldview because it's called the kingdom of God. You have been taught differently because in the culture, there's always a culture that resists the kingdom of God. Now, here's why I think this is so important. If we're gonna be strengthened this year, That means we need to see the purpose of why we're where we are, why God has you living where you are. Because Paul addressing this, watch what happened. When he addressed the situation, there was a tremendous effect of the gospel. Now I'm not reading all of you what happened in Acts 19, 20, but there was powerful things that happened. In one place, the gospel had such recourse that it began to affect the economy because the economy was around worshiping the goddess of Artemis. And when Christians got saved, they saw there were things in their life that they were not to have anymore. Now, I want you to see the passion when Paul says, when I heard of your faith, this is deeper than I just heard you're a Christian. He's talking about people who had laid their life down. They had overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And don't forget the third thing. We overlooked that when we quote that verse. And they love not their own lives. I'm looking for a group of Christians who are New Testament Christians. Because everywhere there's a hindrance in me, it's where I love my own life. And when Paul said, I heard of your faith. <laughs> He wasn't saying, I'm glad you're going to church. (laughs) It's not about us coming to church. It's about the church coming together, isn't it? When he said, when I saw the faith, I knew what you had overcome because he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I fought with the beast in Ephesus. What was that beast? Some translations say that that was wild animals. No, 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 no. We have no indication in Ephesus that he fought the wild animals. That is a spiritual principality called Artemis. He said, I fought with the beast. Whether you realize it or not, you're in a spiritual warfare. We're talking about being strong. It's not so you can be strong. It's so that the gospel will have entrance. We talk about you being a man of God. It's not about you being a man of God. It's so your family will be strong. Why? Because every godly decision is against a beast. Did you know in the New Testament, beasts are seen as principalities. You look over the book of Daniel, you see a lot of beasts. All of those are kingdoms, right? And when Daniel was praying, the angel showed up and said, when the first time you began to pray and fast 21 days ago, Gabriel said, I was on my way, but the prince of Persia resisted me. There is a resistance that comes through the spirit of the world. And it gets into the church 
as it did in Corinth. And you don't even know it. It's subtle. You don't know the level of the dealings of the principality in your own city, but somebody coming into the other city, might, coming into the city might see it quicker than you are because we get put to sleep, don't we? When Paul said, I heard of your faith. <laughs> Man, that explodes inside of me because he wasn't saying, I heard you're still a Christian. He said, no, I heard you overcame. I haven't seen your face in five years. I've been praying for you. And when I heard of that, I have not ceased to pray. <laughs> Why? Because he said, I gave you everything with tears for three years, night and day. I poured into you. I held nothing back. Come on. How many of you want that kind of group of believers? That means when you see people changed by the gospel and you hold fast to the word of God, the spirit of the age will say the Bible can't be trusted. Then errant and infallible is not there. You can't trust on anything absolute. The whole culture we have speaks opposite of the faith that's in you. How I many of you know what I'm talking about? The struggle in your faith is not whether or not you get something when you pray. The struggle of your faith is whether or not you're gonna trust God completely for everything in your life. And what he provides, he'll provide. But Paul said, I know what it's like to have nothing and I know what it's like to have everything. And when he said, I can do all things through Christ, he's talking about I can walk through this life in all circumstances. That's faith. That's what he's talking about when he said, when I heard of your faith. <laughs> Why? Because he knew the craftsmen in that city had lost income. Let me read you this. The scripture tells us, and I'm not bothering to read this, I'm skipping over it, but when those Christian people got saved and transformed, their life changed so much, they brought things and burned them. I think my wife is still regretting burning off her Elton John records when she came to Christ. <laughs> the original Elton John records. But how many know her heart was saying, I don't want nothing in me but Jesus. Come on. Now I tried to buy a, con a check ticket for her to go to the concert and they were so expensive I couldn't do it, so... But there's a difference between the spirit of the age getting a hold of you. I want somebody to listen to me. Getting into your where you draw back. Where you draw back. Because it's the subtle things, isn't it? If we're gonna be strong in the Lord, there's two things that's gonna be evidence of this. Or is your faith, trust in God, and your love for God's people. Do you remember, I'm not saying you're not on fire, if I can use that term now, but when you first really were on fire for God, you loved the church, didn't you? You thought everybody were angels for two years. Come on. You know, it takes two and a half years to find the devil anyway. When a pastor goes pastor a church somewhere and he's so happy for two and a half years, I say, oh, it takes you three years to find the devil. About two and a half years, you start finding the devil. Judas didn't show up till after a while. People are people, aren't they? Life is life. But when you see the revelation of the church, you see something different. You don't know people after the flesh, you know them after the spirit. You see Christ in them. And every individual becomes valuable. There has to be a revelation of this. And Paul was preaching, here's what, these Christians came and they burned their paraphernalia of worshiping Artemis. And the scripture says 50,000 pieces of silver would not have paid for all of those items. That's about $5 million today. How many think there'd be an uproar in Claremore <laughs> if it affected the economy? may not be on the city level, but there's something in our nation. Man. That's why the first thing God deals with us is about our finances, isn't it, Bob? Because if you're not totally surrendered to him in every area, you're gonna be fearful. 
And the scripture says in verse, chapter 19, verse 23, there arose a, no small, no little disturbance. <laughs> I like the scripture. It was no small one. No little disturbance concerning the way, concerning Christ. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. Though these he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades. Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but almost all of Asia, with all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away great many people saying that God's made with hands are not God's. What he's saying is messing us up. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, that she may even be disposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worships. Now, the reason I show you that is that you're in a spiritual battle over your faith. That's massive. I'm not concerned about you being discouraged today. I'm concerned about the faith tomorrow and the next day. You'll have momentary discouragements. Those are nothing. Where is the the foundation of the faith. Because you see, in every circumstance, in our nation, in every nation, in every place, when the church begins to be revived and there's a reformation that starts to take place, it will be a conflict with the culture. And people will say to Christians, you're not supposed to be political. And I get that. I'm not supposed to be a political activist, but you can't be a Christian and not be political. Because politics comes out of your belief system. If you talk to the Christians, 40,000 that are in prison in North Korea, they will tell you they're there because of their faith in Jesus Christ. But North Korea will tell you they're there because they disrupted government. It's political. Are you listening to me? Somebody in this room needs to be strengthened. Because it's going to happen in America. The church is either going to be the church or not be the church. And God is calling his church to be the church. If you're in China right now and the officials just came in and burned the building down, or if you're an underground church, they put your leaders in prison. They didn't do it because you love Jesus. Now, you know that. Because of the faith that Paul's talking about. But what they will tell you is they are disruption to the government. I hope somebody's listening to me. When they persecuted the apostles, you know why? Not because they love Jesus. It said because they came preaching there was another king. Is anybody listening? You see, there is two kingdoms at work, isn't there? When Paul said, I wrestled with the beast of Ephesus, what do you think he's talking about? He's talking about when I preached the gospel and I labored in prayer and in tears, I wrestled with the beast of the gospel. I saw the tentacles of the strongholds of that culture being broken off of the people as they came into the kingdom. They were delivered out of the kingdom of darkness and translated over the kingdom of his dear son. He saw it in a different way. When the disciples came back to Jesus and said, even the demons are subject to us, Jesus said, I know, I was watching. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. He's not talking about eons of time, but when John laid his hands on someone to heal them, he saw the power of Satan broken off that person's life. The church, I want you to see this, this the church is a magnificent power in any city. And we have abdicated our place of boldness. Come on. I said we've abdicated, and I'm not talking about being arrogant. I'm talking about being willing to take some stripes for Jesus. You will probably never be beaten in this country. Maybe. This may sound weird to you. But persecution 
out of somebody's mouth are the same marks of Jesus when the apostles said we glorified that we bear in our body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brother Young from China changed my life in his book called The Heavenly Man. When he tells about how he got out of prison, you got to read that book and get this. Amy said the persecution was so severe she had to skip over portions of the book. He said there are times that he looks back on those beatings. This sounds crazy, but he said, I don't miss the beatings, but I miss the glory of Christ that I experienced right before I went unconscious. <laughs> he said, I never had such a oneness with God. Don't you feel sorry for any Christians being persecuted? So don't you feel sorry for yourself? Let's have a party. Let's brag on those marks on our body. I don't mean the wrong attitude. It's, it's, it's a way of thinking that we have to think biblically when Paul said, I don't think he enjoyed any beatings, do you? But he said, oh, I take delight. What does he mean by that? What does it mean to go through a real trial? Brother Young said that when he was beaten, and you got to read it how he walked out of prison. Man, it's, a, it's a Acts 29. How he got free from prison. He couldn't even walk. I mean, it's, it's an unbelievable way how he escaped out of prison. I mean, walked out of prison in China and left the country. Nobody does that. You ought to hear his story. But when he got back to the Western world, particularly in Canada and some other nations, he said word began to pass out on the internet and other places that his story was not true and they never was in prison and those people there never did send him, yada, yada, yada. And he said, John, he said, the greatest persecution wasn't the beatings, but it was the words of people. He said, that persecution was the strongest I've ever experienced. What I'm telling you is you're going to have to be strong. Aren't you? Compassionate towards people. When Paul was speaking, and it says that they rose, got hard, he turned and began to take the disciples and take them in. And when they rose up with such persecution against the Christians, the Bible said in one place that they went and gathered into the, it's open theater, amphitheater. Amy and I were there during our trip to Ephesians and they say it seats 25,000 people. So we don't know how many thousand were there, but you see these little protests on TV and they've got 50 people and it looks like there's 500 or because they got the way they do the camera and you hear them, you hear them chanting, right? Think of this thousands, if not 20,000 people for two hours saying, great is the Artemis of the Ephesians. Great. Can you imagine? I mean, they're a mob. And they gathered two of the disciples, took them in. And Paul says, I'm going in. They said, no, you're not. His disciples, thank God for team ministry. There are times that we're not always aware of what we're supposed to do. And the disciples pulled him aside, said, no, you're not. How many said we need each other? No, no long rangers in this. It's too important. No wonder he had such a connection with them. And the scriptures tell us that as a result of that screaming and all that went, went on, there's a great disruption. And Paul does not go back into Ephesus, but when he's in Miletus, about 50 miles away, he calls for those elders. Now watch this. He's been out here ministering, and when they, when they wouldn't let him come back in, he called for them about 50 miles away and they got together. And that's in Acts 20 when he begins to tell them to guard the sheep whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Take care of the church of God because when I'm gone, grievous wolves are gonna come out from among you. And there's gonna be people who form disciples after themselves. One of the ways you can tell if someone is uh, off is that they gather people after themselves and rather unto the body of Christ and unto Christ. They're discipling. They want people to depend upon them. 
I'm telling you, I don't want people to depend upon me. I want you to grow in Christ so that you depend upon him and each other, but we need each other, do we not? And he said, there'll be those who pull people aside out of your own midst. Can you see the burden he's carrying? No wonder when he said, when I heard of your faith. In that passage, he left them. He said, I know right now, you're not gonna see my face again. Wow. You're not gonna see me again. Everywhere I go, the Holy Spirit through prophecy tells me that I'm gonna be bound and you won't see me again. Let's talk about that moment. What does it mean when it says, when I heard of your faith? That's no elementary thing, is it? This is more than believing in Jesus, saints. This is total surrender, trust in Christ. Can I tell you what your challenge is this morning? Not addictions. It's a lack of trust in Christ. It's not strongholds. It's a total lack of trust in God. Those have become idols of the heart, haven't they? Idolatry is one of the most prevalent sins that we carry. Idols of the heart. I think it's interesting when Jesus over in Luke chapter 17 tells his disciples, he said, if your brother sins against you and comes and asks you to forgive him, comes and says, repent, forgive me, you forgive him. Seven times in one day. That's where Peter gets that word when he says, Lord, 70 times seven, you know, when he says seven times and, God, and Jesus says 70 times seven. In other words, seven is perfection, isn't it? 70 times seven means there's no end to perfection. What is he saying? He said, forgive your brother. What did the disciples ask? What did they ask? They didn't say, Lord, strengthen our forgiveness. What did they say? They said, increase our faith. Come on. That seems weird, doesn't it? Did you know your offenses is a lack of faith? You know your unforgiveness is a lack of faith. You know your self-pity is a lack of faith because God's not gonna take care of them quick enough. And I'm sure not gonna forgive you because if I do, I'm gonna let you off the hook. And I want you punished for a little bit longer. I want you to feel my wrath. Unforgiveness is a lack of faith. Jesus said it. And we can't even be proud in forgiving. Because he turns around and tells this silly story. He said, if you have a servant goes out, works all day in the field, and he comes in, you don't even thank him because that's what servants do. You don't say to him, sit down here at the table, have something to eat. You say, go ahead and fix my dinner. And when he's finished with that, you don't thank him. Why? Because that's what servants do. He's saying to you, even when you trust me, it's no big deal. That's just what you do. That's what my people do. They trust me. When I'm in self-pity or you're in self-pity, it's a lack of faith because God's not gonna get me out of this. If we charge God foolishly, and I'm telling you, people don't like this. They believe faith is about getting something for them. I'm not saying God will not provide for you. That's not the focus of your faith. If you talk to people about faith, we have twisted it so much in the American culture. Faith is about getting something from God. I believe in asking, and if you ask, you'll receive. But if you see that as what we're talking about in strength, you're gonna miss it. Faith is I trust God. They did me wrong. God's in charge. I don't think he is, I'm gonna make it work for them. God's in charge. Are you with me? Reserve wrath for him. He's a better, he's better at it, isn't he? His mercy is better than yours too. David was given a choice. You want God's mercy, you want man's mercy. He said, I'll take yours all day long. Your wrath is tough, but I know your mercy. What is the significance of Paul saying, when I heard of your faith? Are you getting the picture? The significance is, where are you right now strengthened in the Lord? Because I know, I, I know what messes us up. 
is I don't know if I can trust him enough that he can take care of everything in my life. That, that I don't know if I can trust him with my relationships. I mean, I watch people entangled in wrong relationships, even sinful relationships, because they can't trust God. I, I know people in bondages of all kinds of addictions. Why? Because I've experienced those bondages that slip into you so easily. Come on, don't they? Because we've disassociated ourselves from what it really means. We're like, we have separated, we have two different people. We have the person that goes to church and we have the person that does not know they are the church. And when Christ begins to enter in, he demands everything from us, total trust. And then what's that statement when he says, when I heard of your love for the saints. <laughs> I want this as a revelation, church. I want it for us. When I use the word church, please, I'm not talking about the institution. I'm not talking about denomination. I'm not talking about any kind of organizational thing. I'm talking about people. I'm talking about the body of Christ. I'm talking about the precious gifts of Christ in this city. He said, when I heard of your love for God's people, do you remember when you were the first became acquainted with God, you loved all of God's people, didn't you? Like I said, you didn't even think there was any problem with any of them. And then after you've been there about two years, you found out, wait a minute, they're fleshly too. They're not forgiven yet. And so we attacked the church. I hear so many people attacking the church. I'm going, wait a minute. Somebody said, well, I love Jesus. I just can't put up with his people. I mean, it sounds cool, but it's terrible theology. Because it's impossible. You can't love Jesus and not love his people. And anywhere there's no love for God's people, there's a misunderstanding of what the gospel is about. Because it's about people who are forgiven, transformed by the grace of God, even though they've not arrived yet. And even in their bondages, their bondages becomes the testimony to grace. Hilda, I've asked you publicly, and it's not the right time to ask you. Amy said, you want me to slip over and ask her? I said, no, I've talked to Hilda before. Can I tell Hilda's story about her testimony? Hilda, can I tell your story of your cardboard testimony a few years ago? Hilda walked up here on this platform what, three, maybe six years ago, seven years, ten years ago. I can't remember. It's before we started over to Wausau. Man, time flies. She had a cardboard up here that said, abortion, turned it over, free from shame and forgiveness. That's the church. My wife would tell you, she was living in that world and she would say, I never had abortion because I never needed one. But before I found Christ, that would have been the way I would have gone. You know what's so good about that? That calls you to be compassionate toward people, doesn't it? And that Sunday morning, Hilda, there was a young couple that slipped in in our service that morning. And they'd already decided they had their appointment with abortionists that week. This unmarried couple slipped in. They're facing this trouble while they do. And there was Hilda. <laughs> they said, they looked at each other. They looked at each other and said, they said, our eyes communicated. <laughs> on the car, in the car on the way home, they said, we can't. <laughs> they weren't church people. I'm talking to you about faith as effects the community <laughs> because shame is gone it's broken after we started the campus over in Owasso I'm sitting with the Smiths at dinner and this gal came up to Amy and I and she said I know who you are can I tell you my story she began to tell me that story and she pulled out her phone and she said can I show you my two-year-old boy blonde-headed my husband, we got married. My husband and I are serving Jesus and we're active in First Baptist Church here in Claremore, Oklahoma because I heard the testimony of the redeeming grace of God. <laughs> and the principality over our nation was broken. One more time. Are you listening to me? 
Every righteous choice. You're fighting a beast in Ephesus. Are you listening to me? Every, when he said, I hear of your faith and I hear of your love for the saints. He said, I couldn't stop but to give thanks for you and to pray that the God would grant you revelation and wisdom that you might know him because that's the only way you're gonna stand strong is the revelation of who God is how he changes your understanding of him. No wonder A.W. Tozer said the most important thing about you is what you think about God. I believe our nation is facing a big challenge. I believe every day we get up, we hear the news. Don't look at it as the news. Pray in the spirit because there's colliding of principalities in the area. I love it when our pastors pray together. We pray that way. We understand. We understand the spiritual consequences. Over the last 39 years, Amy and I have watched the effect of the gospel on this city. I'm grateful for what's happening in the city. We're not all there yet, but let me tell you, things have changed in 39 years in Claremore, Oklahoma. Your decisions you make make a difference generationally, don't they? You're breaking the strongholds of darkness generationally. That's what the gospel does. That is the faith. Contend for the faith. There's two things I wanna ask you today before you walk out of here. They're gonna put that on the screen. And it says, here's the two indicators of spiritual strength. At the end of this first quarter of the year, maybe we should ask ourselves, do I trust Christ in every area of my life? And do I have a compassion and passion for the body of Christ? I think that's a fair question, don't you? I think that's a fair question. I want you to stand right where you are across this room. When I think of the scriptures about the love of Christ, when Jesus talks about Matthew 25, when he brings the sheep nations and the goat nations, He said, I'll take those who are righteous and I'll say to them, when I was hungry, you fed me. And when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And when I was in prison, you visited me. And when I was sick, you were there to visit me. And they said, Lord, when did we do that? We've taken that scripture and we've turned it to say, the church ought to be in the community. And I believe the church ought to be in the community. Don't misunderstand me. Because Paul said, wherever opportunity you have, do good. But especially to the church. And here's what I want you to see. When Jesus is given that testimony, he said, when you've done the least of these, you've done it unto my brothers. Hebrew says it's his church that he calls his brothers. All of creation are the image of God, but those who are in Christ when you go visit a saint in the hospital, how many of you today, if I said, how many of y'all like to go visit Jesus this afternoon? How many of you'd go? He said, that's what you're doing. When you go into the prison and in that context, it was the apostles who were beaten and somebody took them a cup of water. He said, you visited me. I want you to get a heart for the church in the city so that nothing is in our mouth against the church. Nothing is in our voice against the church. Are you with me? It's his bride. It's his bride. There was a young pastor in this town years ago was preaching against the church. And I heard him saying, and he had all these things about charge of the church. I met with him one day and I said, you're talking about Christ church. You're talking about God's bride. And he looked at me. He said, I know God had a bride. I, I usually use the word wife. I said, you're talking against God's wife. He said, what do you mean? When I told him, he said, oh, I never saw that. God changed his heart and he started a series and he had his wife dress up in a wedding gown and he preached a whole series on the bride of Christ and how we're to love the church. There's something about revelation of knowing, am I compassionate? Not about my ministry, but about the church. Not about what I can do, but for the body of Christ. Are you with me? That's what Paul was talking about when he was saying, when I heard of your love for the church, I knew we were going to make it. When I heard of your faith and the confidence as you overcome by faith, I knew we were going to make it. When I heard your compassion for the church, I knew it. When you're teaching in a ministry, it's not the ministry, it is what? People. 
It's this church, isn't it? I love our children's ministry, but it's not about children's ministry. It's about the bride of Christ. I love our youth ministry, but it's not about our youth ministry. It's about the bride of Christ. Are you with me? It's about people. About a week ago, I was praying and I heard the Holy Spirit say, <laughs> who's the Epiphus? And I got this for Owasso, but I'm gonna use it for all of us. Who's the Epiphus? And I went and looked up, I knew where it was mentioned three or four times, Epiphus, and here's what it says in Philemon. He was a faithful servant of Christ. And then over in Colossians chapter four, it said, this faithful servant of God who wrestles in prayer for you that you might be fully mature and full of assurance. You know what the Lord's telling me? If this is gonna be a year of strengthening, we're gonna to need to have some epiphys in the church who will labor for the body of Christ. I was reminded of Rosalie, who Lord willing, Amy and I are gonna to get to see her in May on her 90th birthday in May labored for 25 years in this house. No one knows the hours of prayer. John, you're the fruit, you and all of you, the fruit of this. I tell you, when we get to heaven, we're gonna be standing in the back of the line. Because <laughs> there's some epiphases that God's given us. <laughs> My call this morning is church. We've got a calling beyond coming together here on Sunday morning. We have a calling to be strong in the faith, to make righteous decisions that breaks generational curses and to say, God, you've called me not to love my life to myself, but to birth in this city, a mature bride of Christ. The only way it's gonna work is intercession and prayer, laboring in prayer, working in prayer. He said he has not ceased. Let me read that scripture to you real quickly, if I could. Colossians, I've gotta read it. I just ran past it this morning and when I got through, I said, no, 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 Glenn, you've gotta, you got to read that in Colossians chapter 4. Listen to what he said about Epaphras. He says to him, or about him, he says, excuse me, Colossians 4, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. He says of Epaphras, he's talking about him when he says, Ephraim, who is one of you, <laughs> a servant of Christ Jesus, he greets you, always wrestling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Father, if there's going to be anyone stand this year, it's because we're going to stand with them in prayer the body for the body. Individuals in this house whom you've called, Spirit of God, your will be done. I wanna do something here, if it's okay. We wouldn't normally do this on Sunday morning. But while the worship team comes and joins us, I want you, if you would, you may be a guest here today, so I hope it's not uncomfortable for you. Could we come here at the front? Can I just invite the church to come together here at the front. You may have to squeeze in here at the front. Amy, would you join me here on the platform? <laughs> I want to close today by a call of the Spirit. If you have withdrawn, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but if you've withdrawn from the passion of the Spirit, there's some people I believe that He's adding to us, and I believe there's people among us who are those saints who are totally given to trust in Christ. Totally given to trust in Christ. That means it's gonna cost, doesn't it? What does it cost? Your way. It costs because it's only His way. But it's worth it. There's individuals in this room that God's stirring your heart. We would have called it maybe years past a calling. <laughs> I believe all of us have a calling, but you know there are individuals that God's putting the demand on you that He's not put on others. I believe there's a fresh stirring of the Spirit. <laughs> there's a work of His grace. When we selected this theme, John, it wasn't perhaps any chance, was it? <laughs> that we'd be strengthened. I need this year 
Bob, I need this year. I need this year in understanding of the call of God on my life. You need this year to understand the call of God on your life. <laughs> Here's my prayer is that God would go beyond anything that we are organizing or doing and he would put his finger on the heart of a younger generation to say, I will be the one I will be one of those who will take it for the next 30 or 40 years in prayer and in the Spirit. We need more effortless among us. There's some saints in this house. You know how to pray. Can I ask you to hear the voice of the Spirit? To pray. Go out of your way and come to prayer meetings. Find a place. Create them. <laughs> It's not by our strength, it's by His Spirit, isn't it? Amy, you feel the stir in your heart. We were talking a week ago. It's like God's challenging us again, isn't He? (laughs) We have to be the first partakers. I want you to join hands with someone next to you, if you will. How are you doing in the beginning of this year in your strength and the power of His might? Total trust in Christ. If you're here today and you've never turned from your own righteousness, what that means is if you think I'm a pretty good person, I know people worse than I am, I guess I'm all right. That is indication you're dependent upon your own goodness. It doesn't work. Faith in Christ says there's only one good, that's Jesus. I'm like anybody else, I need a savior. I need Jesus and Jesus, I accept what you did for me at the cross. If that's you, you're dependent upon your own goodness. I ask you to shift your heart today at the Holy Spirit. If you're here today as a believer, I want you to hear it as a body. There's something in this city that God's called this house to with the other congregations in this city. So Father, I pray right now that your will would be done. And I pray what Paul said, that we would be granted a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, Father. Lord, there's a whole world culture that speaks opposite of the Word of God. Our minds are bombarded. Our TV, our internet, our phones, the computers tell us opposite. The news tells us opposite. Oh, Father God, supernaturally guide us by your Spirit. Strengthen your church today, I pray. Pray for the one on your left, would you? Say, God, I take that moment to pray for the one on the left and then pray for the one on the right. If there's somebody on your right, pray for the one on your left and then there's somebody on your right for the presence and the power of God. I thank God for intercessors and for disciples and people who carry the burden of the call of God in this house. I feel like to somebody, you feel like you've just drawn back. The Lord says, no, I'm calling you forward. It's not time to draw back. You remember a time when you were really pressing in. Today, the Holy Spirit says, I'm calling you forward. I'm calling you forward. It's not the time to back away. You said, well, I got offended. I know Jesus said, it's about faith. It's about you being strengthened in your faith so you can trust Him anyway. We need a house full of people who are not easily offended because they're strong in faith. I believe in getting healed over my wounds. You know that, we preach about that a lot. But let's not get so focused upon our wounds that we ignore the healing because the healing is the releasing of faith in what Christ has done and is doing. Hebrews says, you've not resisted to blood. Nobody's killed you yet. You're gonna make it. So Father, strengthen us today. Fill us with the wisdom and the spirit of revelation in all areas.